Hi, I'm Tim Bush, founder of the Napa Institute. Welcome to our virtual conference on principled entrepreneurship, woke capitalism. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our winery, uh, Trinitas Cellars. It's run by Garrett Bush, our son, uh, in Napa Valley. Many of you who have come to our in-person conferences have enjoyed this wine. Uh, you can go in the meantime to purchase our wine on our website at trinitascellars.com. You'll note that this first wine here is Cabernet Francis. The Pope himself drinks this wine. I give it to him every year, and it's a Cabernet Franc wine. This fall, we're going to have a new one called Two Popes. It'll be made out of Red Zinfandel and Cabernet Franc. Those are the vintages that we made for Pope Benedict XVI, the Ratzinger, and the Cabernet Francis, uh, which is Cabernet Franc. So look for that one, Two Popes. It's a great blend. God bless all of you, and thank you for your support of the Knapp Institute. I look forward to seeing all of you in person, especially next summer in July 21 at our summer conference. God bless you. Hello, I'm Robert George. I'm a Cormac Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. And I am delighted uh, and honored by the invitation of my friends at the Napa Institute uh, to conduct an interview uh, today with uh, my dear old friend, uh, Paul Singer. Let me just make a very brief introductory remark before uh, introducing uh, Mr. Singer and beginning our conversation. The tradition of Catholic social teaching, which includes a robust teaching on what academics call political economy, uh, began in earnest in the wake of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. The founding document in the tradition is often regarded as Pope Leo XIII's great encyclical, Rerum Novarum. Uh, I say they began in earnest because Catholic thinking about uh, matters of political economy and social life uh, dates back, of course, uh, much, much further. And there were significant refinements in the teaching, even as early as the 16th uh, century with the development of money markets, in Europe especially, uh, beginning in southern Germany, uh, giving uh, place to the uh, foundations really of a modern economy. And in that tradition of uh, Catholic uh, social teaching, uh, although it's not remarked as much as it uh, uh, used to be or should be, uh, what the church calls socialism is outright condemned, not just Marxism, which is obviously uh, going to be condemned by uh, any tradition of faith for its atheism. But socialism considered as the social ownership, the government ownership, uh, or significant government control of the means of production. The tradition, however, also uh, criticized what it sometimes called uh, capitalism or laissez-faire, the unregulated uh, free market, and certainly rejected anything like a social Darwinist approach to economic and uh, social matters. But it did not condemn far from it. Uh, it affirmed private property uh, and the market economy, giving rise to a long discussion which continues to go on and uh, is shaped by lots of uh, events and will continue uh, to develop about the role of the business firm, what the business firms uh, proper stance is, uh, how it should be uh, operated, what its good is for the common good, for the broader uh, society. And those discussions are important. It's important that they be carried on, not just among Catholics, but with our friends from every other tradition of faith, especially thoughtful people like my uh, guest today, deeply informed, knowledgeable uh, people who have important things to say. 50 years ago, Milton Friedman uh, wrote his famous essay, the social responsibility of business to increase its profits. Uh, ever since, uh, his thesis has come under attack. Most of those attacks have come from the political left. But occasionally, and in recent years more often, conservatives have argued that companies which focus exclusively or too narrowly on profits will overlook other important social goods family stability and child rearing, for example, national security, uh, middle class or bourgeois or Victorian uh, virtues, social cohesion, disaster uh, preparedness, uh, what have you. 
Uh, well, that's an important set of criticisms. It's an important conversation to have. And that's why it's so great that we have with us uh, uh, Paul Singer. Paul and I go back as friends nearly uh, 20 years. We met when Paul reached out to me because of uh, his interest in higher, reform, uh, higher education reform. I had uh, very recently founded the James Madison program at Princeton and Paul learned about it and was interested in whether similar initiatives could be undertaken at other institutions, including some with which he himself had uh, associations. Uh, and uh, we have been friends ever since. Paul's been a generous supporter of higher education reform, my own initiatives and uh, others. But of course, he's best known not for that, but for his pioneering work uh, in business, especially in uh, money management. His views on markets and the role of markets and the direction uh, markets will uh, be going in uh, is renowned. Uh, his newsletter is one that I always read. And when I read it, I feel I learn so much that I actually wish I had some money to invest. But I'd imagine for people who actually do have money, uh, Paul's uh, uh, newsletters are real uh, blessings. Uh, Paul's a committed conservative who cares about and philanthropically supports social cohesion, national security, disaster preparedness, and other values uh, that are those that are sometimes invoked by uh, critics of the Friedmanite view. Uh, there are few people who can address these uh, questions and uh, concerns uh, with more rigor of thought uh, and depth of thought than Paul. So I am so delighted, Paul, to have you uh, here with us. And let me uh, begin by a straightforward uh, question. Uh, critics of shareholder capitalism uh, often don't appreciate what shareholders are and what shareholders do. The shareholder seems to disappear uh, in the analysis uh, or get obscured behind a screen. Uh, I think the way we should start is by uh, explaining, and I'd ask you to explain, uh, who are the shareholders? And how do they normally engage with management, with CEOs and leaders of uh, uh, public companies? Um, what is the role of the shareholder? I think it's most useful to, um, to um, uh, start discussing these matters with a, um, and thank you, uh, Professor George, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, um, is to start with the notion of uh, ownership um, and start with the notion of a, a, a business owned by a single person. Um, um, uh, a single person uh, gathering inputs, hiring people, producing a product or a service. Um, the shareholder, the owner, is the person who is responsible ultimately responsible for the business uh, and for the prospects of the business. And the business um, uh, is designed, uh, w basically whatever the business is, to provide for the, uh, the owner and the family of the owner um, uh, and uh, also provides uh, um, uh, employment, uh, uh, provides um, uh, commerce within, within the, uh, the overall economy. The owner is buying something or uh, ga gathering inputs uh, in order to provide the product or the um, uh, the service. The owner is responsible. the The glory of American, um, I, it's 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 global, but it's I, be I believe it's an American, um, um, not invention necessarily, but um, the growth of shareholder capitalism or broadly dispersed capitalism. Uh, I think is basically an American, um, um, one of those American d designs that um, that takes over um, <laughs> takes over um, uh, uh, um, uh, the world, uh, so to speak. And what I mean by that is um, the buy-in to capitalism, the buy-in to the ability to make money and make a profit and um, and keep property and own property. Um, uh, uh, is is to a great extent um, uh, supported by the the notion that this dispersed capitalism, this dispersed ownership, um, gives 
little people, medium people, big people, gives everyone or almost everyone a stake in the private uh, ownership of property. Um, what, it, what I mean by that is that these little pieces of the business that I described as a paradigm a, a moment ago um, enable um, uh, individuals um, either directly or as part of uh, the ownership of a piece of a pension plan or savings plan um, enables those people to feel um, uh, a part of capitalism, a part of the ownership of the means of production. Um, and that buy-in is an important part of what justifies in the, in the mass mind um, justifies um, some people having more than others, some people creating something and keeping it, the notion of private, private property. I believe in the dispersion of power, not uh, the concentration of power. So um, the, answer, the answer to Professor George's question is the shareholders are, are the owners of the business. Um, they are the dispersed and uh, uh, owners of little pieces. They are the same thing as the owner of the the drugstore. My father was a retail pharmacist, or the or the pizza parlor, or the pizza place, or um, uh, any one of a number of different kinds of businesses organized in a lot of different um, uh, ways. Um, um, it, it, it's worth going uh, into uh, corporate governance for a moment. Um, to answer the second part of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Professor George's question, how do how do shareholders engage? Um, the paradigm for um, public capitalism, as practiced in the United States and now uh, in uh, many countries um, uh, around the world, with various levels of reliability, rule of law, um, supportive culture, um, the paradigm is the shareholders, the owners elect a board of directors. The board of directors um, hires management. The board of directors is responsible to the shareholders uh, to um, carry out uh, a corporate strategy, uh, hire and fire management, um, uh, set and reset the strategy. Um, among the problems with uh, public capitalism today and uh, for quite a period of time, is that that paradigm um, gets, uh, has gotten somewhat uh, twisted over a long period of time. Um, twisted in a, in a number of uh, uh, harmful, um, harmful ways. Um, everyone can observe that it doesn't actually appear as if boards of directors are responsible or act as if they're responsible to shareholders. Shareholder engagement is discouraged. It's minimized, there's an annual meeting. The annual meeting is not a full discussion of strategy. Uh, it's, um, it's something that um, the corporate management and the directors try to rush through as quickly as possible. Um, and in fact, an entire um, uh, ecosystem of, um, of uh, support has grown up uh, over a long period of time. Um, support for managements uh, devising ways to beat back shareholder engagement. Now, among the problems with beating back shareholder engagement is that the investing landscape in general has uh, evolved away from a, a management responsibility, board of directors responsibility um, to the shareholders. What are some of the ways it, uh, that it has done that? Index investing, which was a um, a uh, clever idea that you could save costs and achieve the same or higher return because of the lower friction costs by just buying an index or some derivative on a, on, on a um, uh, stock market, uh, usually stock market index, not bond market, but it's both. And over a period of a few decades, index investing, so-called passive investing, has actually come to um, uh, uh, grow so much that it now exceeds uh, active investing. Passive index investing now exceeds in amount under management uh, 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 active investing. What that means is when you are invested in an index, you are not looking at 
um, uh, the performance of a particular company, you're looking at the index and the performance of the index. The index could have dozens or in the case of the uh, Standard & Poor's uh, major index, 500 um, uh, stocks. Um, so you are not engaged. You are not you are not attending meetings. You are not doing the work. You don't have um, 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 uh, employees or colleagues um, pouring over the uh, the public um, financial uh, and other uh, uh, documents. And so, um, the majority of investors in stocks today, institutional investors, are not looking at um, the companies and are not engaged by the very nature of their business. They have outperformed for, um, for two reasons. One is the lower friction cost of uh, not paying high uh, or regular uh, money management fees. Um, and the, uh, the second reason is when there's a flow of money out of a strategy and the flow into a different strategy, the large amounts of money representing those flows um, cause the, the flowy strategy to uh, outperform the, um, the other. So um, it's also the case that um, the proportion of equities um, owned by individual investors has declined and the proportion of equities owned by institutional investors uh, has increased over the um, decades. And what I'm talking about is endowments like Princeton University, pension plans, hospitals, um, uh, uh, museums, uh, um, think tanks, uh, foundations. Um, uh, and, and so the direct uh, individual ownership of stock, uh, stocks, uh, and uh, let me add sovereign wealth funds to the list of institutional investors, um, uh, has diminished, individual investors has diminished as a proportion of overall ownership. Um, and so what this, what this means uh, is that um, um, shareholder engagement um, um, has, has basically devolved to uh, two forms of shareholder engagement. One form, um, sort of the pesky shareholder, is um, uh, people who show up uh, at uh, uh, meetings of shareholders and have particular agendas. They don't like the compensation of the management. They have quirky agendas. They may have social um, justice agendas. Um, and they're not really directly, these, these agendas don't, in many cases, not all cases, of course, um, uh, don't directly impact on the uh, strategy of the, um, the corporations. Then you have activist investors and activist investors. Um, the fund that I've run for 43 and a half years, Elliott Management, um, which is uh, now around $41 billion of capital under management. One of our businesses is active, activist investing, which means we actually evaluate particular companies um, some companies we feel are uh, possibly uh, underperforming or undermanaged. We approach companies uh, uh, and we, um, we have dialogues with companies. Every once in a while, the dialogues uh, turn rancorous. Um, but most of the time, the overwhelming bulk of the time, the dialogue consists of us having done the work, advancing a thesis, discussing it with management, uh, comparing it with their thesis. Uh, and um, usually coming to um, some kind of a, um, uh, an accommodation. So um, the notion of shareholder engagement, um, which has been uh, dis not dissipated, but reduced by these institutional and, um, uh, and market um, uh, forces um, still exists, but it's, it's under pressure. It's an it's an important um, uh, um, uh, part of the equation because earning a rate of return for the owners, if you go back to the first thing that I said, is um, it's not the sole purpose of the corporation. Every corporation needs to be a, um, a good citizen, needs to be a good employer, um, and needs to have relationships with suppliers that it's not, that's not uh, predatory, that's that's a uh, give and take. But let's not forget when discussing um, stakeholder um, uh, supremacy, when discussing common good capitalism, 
Um, let's let's not forget that um, there are tens of thousands of pages of law, rules, regulations, um, uh, frameworks for regulation that uh, regulators um, uh, take creative flight uh, in uh, uh, making up or enforcing uh, or imagining. Um, already uh, operative and uh, impactful on the corporate world, uh, on all of the uh, other um, uh, aspects of stakeholder supremacy, um, uh, the corporation's uh, relationship with employers, uh, sorry, employees, um, uh, suppliers, um, uh, customers, the environment, the community, um, and all of the other um, um, constituencies that this uh, stakeholder supremacy uh, wants to uh, um, elevate as equal um, um, uh, obligations of corporations. Um, see, when 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 we look at stakeholder supremacy as an alternative to shareholder supremacy, what we see is that stakeholder supremacy basically devolves on accountability to, to corporate uh, boards and uh, managements. If you have equal duties to the constituencies that I just named, um, who, does the, who does the board of directors actually report to? And what is the actual goal? Um, every investor, whether a very tiny investor in a, uh, in a pool as, a, as the owner of, or the uh, beneficiary of a pension fund or a, or a large individual investor or a hedge fund or a large institutional um, uh, investor. Every single investor, including uh, Princeton University, of course, uh, and its peers, um, needs to make a rate of return, um, a rate of, rate of return on invested capital. Um, if you say that um, your duty to shareholders is matched in some fashion, um, today not the rule of law, but we can already see stakeholder supremacy entering into the um, the um, rule of law category with um, a variety of um, new laws and rules which are starting to be passed, uh, including one um, seminal uh, uh, law that was just put into effect in uh, uh, in California. But um, when when these duties are all equal, uh, if the duty to suppliers and creditors is equal to the duty to shareholders. What does that actually mean? It, it could only differ from the current situation where the shareholders are the owners of a business uh, and um, are, are attempting to make a rate of return, a profit. Um, it could only differ if you pay more to the suppliers and pay more to the creditors um, uh, and uh, then you are paying them under a arm's length um, okay, I need such and such. Here's what I will pay. Oh, you don't want to supply me that thing at that price? Um, okay, I'll pay another price or I'll go somewhere else. When it's, when it's not the, the management's um, um, uh, uh, ability, morally or legally, um, to um, uh, get its supplies and work on an arm's length basis as an owner, um, obtaining an input, um, I, I think, I think the di the diminution or the impact on rate of return um, is not something that's going to cause a greater uh, common good or a, a greater um, a good for either shareholders or any of the constituencies. Businesses need to remain competitive. Um, they need to to survive. You cannot survive uh, if you're paying your employers the wrong price, um, you also cannot su uh, uh, survive and compete against uh, global companies who are um, uh, uh, engaged in the same, uh, same activity and trying to, um, uh, trying to uh, either compete with you or put you out of business um, if you mistreat people. Um, and so um, this, um, this uh, current um, 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 struggle, um, ideological struggle uh, between adding to that um, that um, tens of thousands of pages of regulations, 
already on every one of those topics, adding a, a vague, impossible to uh, uh, parse and understand set of additional obligations that are not part of the rules and regulations that are written down and that you can you can interpret you can look at them and say oh here's what here's what my duty is it's not to discriminate it's to it's to uh, it's not to defraud my suppliers uh, and creditors but to add as an equal somehow um, uh, um, obligation um, uh, to the obligation to shareholders uh, uh, is um, and uh, will be to the extent that uh, um, gathers force uh, dysfunctional. So um, I apologize for a uh, not concise answer to a concise question, Professor George. <laughs> well, it was hardly a, a concise question, but I'm grateful for the answer, uh, Paul. There are a number of things there that I think uh, uh, we ought to talk about. We're going to have to limit the number of them, of course, just because of the amount of time that we have available to us. But I think uh, your Catholic friends at the Napa Institute would uh, immediately have picked up on a couple of the important things you mentioned. Uh, first, near the beginning of your uh, answer there, you talked about the importance of uh, private ownership, of private property. And as I said in my own opening remark, one of the things that has been central to the church's uh, witness uh, when it comes to its social teaching is the importance of private property. Private property, far from being a bad thing, is a good thing. In fact, it's such a good thing that the church teaches that we should arrange our uh, economic uh, rules and practices to maximize the opportunities for people, including ordinary people, to own property, have a stake uh, in the productive uh, economy, which of course strengthens everyone's stake uh, all the way down uh, the line, uh, even people of modest means, uh, maximizes their stake in the success of the overall uh, social enterprise. Again, uh, the problem with socialism is that it takes away uh, the concept of private uh, property. Uh, that obviously damages uh, the, the goal of having as many people benefiting directly from the productive economy as owners uh, as possible. Uh, a second point that I think uh, would immediately have come to mind, Paul, when you mentioned uh, the importance to you of trying to uh, disperse power is the doctrine of what's called subsidiarity uh, in this tradition uh, of Catholic social teaching. This is the idea that uh, problems should be solved by people themselves when possible, but as near to the people whose problems are being solved as possible when they can't be solved by the people themselves. So if an individual can do something, let the individual uh, do it and accomplish it. Uh, if, if an individual can't, but we can do it as families, let's do it as families. Uh, if we can't do it as families, we can do it as small communities, do it as small communities. Don't bring the government in or larger units of society in to manage people's affairs when people can do uh, as well or better uh, for themselves. Another way of saying that is that power over people should be exercised as close to the people as possible. So there's as much accountability as possible and people get the benefit of, uh, of doing for themselves. When we do that, power will be dispersed. It won't be all centralized. It won't be uh, right there at the top and then just bearing down uh, on people. So those are certainly some uh, resonances, Paul, uh, between what you say and uh, the tradition of a lot of your Napa Valley, uh, Napa Institute friends. Um, at the same time, of course, the church has always taught and Catholics uh, firmly uh, believe in the importance of avoiding the kinds of practices that do uh, undermine justice and the common good uh, that can be engaged in in ways that are, are, are damaging uh, to, to human beings and, and their rights. So exploitation, uh, abuse, uh, manipulation, uh, monopolization, uh, these things the church has always taught, this great tradition of social teaching has always taught, uh, can properly be opposed by government, including by regulatory policies, which is why the tradition has always rejected the idea of the pure laissez-faire model of capitalism, even while affirming private property in the market. There are obviously legitimate regulations, necessary regulations, in order to avoid uh, evils that can be done uh, in the name of uh, the market or by the functioning of the market where the market is simply unregulated. 
It's also noted in the tradition that the market can undermine itself when power is used in the market to skew uh, the market, to undermine the functioning of the market itself. And we see a lot of that, I think, today. And I think it's one of the things that's driving some of the concerns of those promoting stakeholder uh, capitalism, whether they're right to propose it, uh, that's obviously a debatable proposition. But I think some of their concerns, Paul, are things like crony capitalism, uh, rent seeking, uh, uh, the uh, use of big government uh, to, um, uh, and especially of regulatory power, uh, to squeeze out uh, small startup operations that challenge uh, big uh, companies, but can't bear the regulatory burden uh, that the big companies can uh, absorb. And of course, the problem of, uh, of, of plutocracy. Uh, but I gather from what you're saying uh, that uh, uh, you uh, are not rejecting the idea that there are legitimate regulations that government uh, puts on uh, business, but that uh, it's important that, that government not undermine the fundamental idea that the firm is owned by the shareholders and it's the shareholders' interests that need to be primary in the business and with the, um, with the directors of the business, that, that the directors are accountable fundamentally to the shareholders. They should, of course, conform with all the just laws that prevent things like exploitation, abuse, fraud. Uh, they should avoid the rent seeking and the crony capitalism and, and, and so forth, but not throw the baby out uh, with the uh, with the bathwater by undermining the very principle of um, uh, shareholder, uh, the primary duty of the shareholders and shareholders accountability, which was another issue I think that you were raising, Paul, shareholders accountability to be active participants in the management of firms. Uh, am, am I am I reading you correctly? Um, yes, and, uh, and uh, you've, um, you've said very, uh, you've, um, um, you've expressed very well the um, the connection between the um, the moral um, um, uh, aspects of the relationship between um, um, quote owners and uh, uh, workers and uh, other constituents in society um, and the and the um, uh, and the legal framework um, uh, around the difference between laissez-faire capitalism and um, rules and laws uh, concerning crony capitalism, um, manipulation, exploitation, antitrust. Um, the, um, the, the problem with, uh, among the problems with uh, stakeholder supremacy um, is, the, is the mushing of th those um, valid concerns of a uh, properly regulated, properly um, uh, controlled set of markets. There are no free markets. Um, there is no laissez-faire. There's nobody really um, uh, in favor of, of laissez-faire. Um, the people that you might think are should be or might be in favor of laissez-faire are actually um, uh, uh, people um, uh, who, uh, um, you know, seek protection or seek stability. Um, the, the problem, though, um, uh, is that Stakeholder supremacy makes boards of directors and managements actually accountable to nobody. Um, uh, they are, of course, accountable to the rules and regulations that, that represent the rule of law, although parenthetically, um, uh, as the regulatory state, the administrative state has grown up, there's more and more of that, ru that rule of law or regulation that is that are just frameworks for regulators to um, uh, uh, imagine um, um, and to take charge of more and more uh, aspects of, uh, of life. But when I say unaccountable in relation to stakeholder supremacy, um, it, it puts boards of directors able to to uh, to take any uh, demand by the owners, the shareholders, and say, but what about what about this constituency? What about that? And actually respond um, uh, and be governed by the uh, the most powerful or persuasive pressure groups um, with their own um, with their own agendas. 
these tens of thousands of pages actually exist, and they and they actually govern um, um, all of the um, depredations, uh, Professor George, that you um, you just mentioned. There's there's um, uh, every every one of the um, the elements of uh, of um, the tenets of uh, stakeholder supremacy are already being um, 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 uh, voluminously um, addressed uh, by a rule uh, and um, law. And so um, I believe that the, the system of, uh, of ownership of private property um, should evolve and uh, I'm not for tossing those tens of thousands of pages into the garbage can, but I'm a mend it, don't end it um, uh, uh, person uh, uh, with that uh, mentality. Um, and I believe that um, if the responsibility of hired management, hired board of directors um, is to carry out um, in a legal fashion, of course, um, the um, direction and the strategy uh, approved by the shareholders. I think that's the best way to generate prosperity, this feeling of shared ownership that both you and I um, uh, have um, just uh, expressed as a, um, as a social good, as, a, as an important part of of the um, of the uh, uh, the the feeling of community and the sense of community and social cohesion, um, uh, and that um, transforming that to something where all of that ru the rules and regulations governing uh, those all of those relationships um, change to this vague um, uh, and um, um, uh, um, power concentrating um, um, uh, mode is is not going to be it's not going to make the people happier it's certainly not going to make um, the holders of capital um, uh, of whom uh, universities and uh, uh, and foundations are very very large uh, uh, parts of it's not going to enable them to to meet their goals Princeton University and other uh, institutions um, need and are budgeting for a rate of return. You talk about the growth, and it's been extraordinary, of course, in the 20th and now in the 21st century of the administrative state, the growth of the size and scope of government, the intrusiveness of government, the power of government, its control. And uh, far from uh, making itself the enemy of big business, it seems to me big business has very comfortably accommodated itself and found ways to use to its advantage the reality of, of, of big business. So getting the administrative state under control, decentralizing power, I think would, would, would benefit us in, in part by forcing big business to be more competitive, by uh, uh, impeding the ability of big business to use regulatory uh, authority of government and its own ability to absorb regulatory costs to make it impossible for uh, competitors to compete, especially new startup competitors to uh, uh, to compete. So anyway, Paul, just to get back to uh, making clear to everyone what you're saying and what you're not saying, uh, can I return to this? Uh, you're not saying profits uh, justify anything and the corporation should be concerned with and only with the pursuit of profits. There's nothing they shouldn't be prepared uh, uh, to do if it will increase uh, profits. There are no rules or moral regulations. It's not that question, am I right? Correct. So it's about what we can do to make sure that we've got a truly competitive market where people can compete in ways that work the magic we would like markets to work. Drive quality up, drive costs down, make participation in the economy as owners available to more and more and more people. Have I got that right? Yes. Um, the, the design of the system uh, uh, that you described um, is, it's not, it's not clear to me th th that the system is designed to provide those benefits. I believe that freedom 
and the dispersion of power and rule of law that is um, uh, understandable, um, um, uh, as clear as it can be, um, um, uh, maintains power, um, the power that is able to be discerned, uh, um, is the path towards uh, creating a sustainable, um, um, broadly profitable uh, system that works for um, uh, m most people. Uh, there's no perfection uh, and um, the uh, no system of economic organization can work for uh, everyone. But um, uh, at the beginning of this conversation, we talked about um, buy-in. Uh, and buy-in is essential. The absence of buy-in is revolution. Um, there are, as you know, revolutionary impulses um, uh, out there uh, uh, nowadays. Um, but uh, buy-in, what buy-in requires is a sense of fairness, a sense of um, uh, uh, ability to, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, have individual and collective uh, opportunity. Um, uh, and um, as much as possible of the regulation and evolving rule of law and law, uh, with circumstances, whether it's the internet or international uh, relationships or the rise in China or any one of a number of factors. Um, it's, it's very important that it be thoughtful, that it be understandable, um, um, and, 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 and to the extent possible, not exaggerate um, just to shade power relationships. When the opponents of freedom talk about the sole uh, a, a goal of capitalism to uh, make a uh, make a profit. What that ignores is what's in front of every um, business person's um, um, consciousness, which is, of, of course, um, we can't um, uh, avoid and not take into account and not have good relationships with and treat well these various other uh, constituencies. And of course, there are rules uh, governing our behavior uh, as managers, uh, as capitalists. Um, uh, but um, to, uh, to um, uh, I think the debate now is um, uh, kind of, okay, here are the rules and laws. In what way do you want to change them? In what way do they actually conform with our institutional framework the constitution um other laws uh, that were that uh, are developed under our constitutional and federal uh, framework um, um um and what else should we be doing um but this this um this vague elevation of equal um uh, corporate obligations uh to these other constituencies is just an invitation of um, uh, to managements and boards of directors to stiff arm uh, the owners. And if uh, we all work, or many of us work in organizations, and if there's no response, ultimate responsibility, then it's the people who just can grab power or just ignore others that want a seat at the table uh, that have. Uh, that have the power, and that's that's the problem with stakeholder supremacy. Um, it's a, it's like an organization that's um, um, run uh, metaphorically like a town hall. It's not the way to run an organization by just well, everybody has equal power. Um, that's not the way things actually can work. Um, and um, the sad thing uh, to me about all of this. Um, stakeholder supremacy is illogical. The um, the virtuous 181 are getting uh, a slap back, uh, metaphorically, uh, somewhat. But um, what I, one of the things I'm worried about is that this push evolves into a kind of mush that this where this virtual signaling finds its way into law. Uh, and uh, uh, people's actual behavior uh, won't be able to be discerned. Actual 
mandated behavior won't be actually able to be discerned. Um, uh, well, and, and, uh, um, if I could interrupt right on that point, and I apologize for it, but I, I have a question. Do you think the net result of that is actually to increase the power of management at the expense of the power of the shareholders? Because if management is responsible and accountable not only to shareholders, but to a larger and vaguer constituency or set of constituencies, it sounds to me like the net beneficiary of that just in terms of power will be management itself. It will mean management is less accountable to anybody. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, also, um, uh, uh, who will suffer is um, the common good. Um, prosperity will suffer uh, if managements um, um, have this extra layer, and it's a it's a thick layer, it's a powerful layer of unaccountability and and uh, and power. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Paul, uh, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing your, your insights, you know, based uh, on much deep thought, as I know, and uh, on many, many uh, years being a, a leader in investment management and a keen observer of, uh, of American and international uh, business. Uh, thank you, too, to the uh, Napa Institute for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, interview Paul and to get together with my uh, dear old friend. Uh, I'm going to now turn it back over to the folks at uh, Napa, uh, Napa Institute, but with my thanks to everybody. Thank you for inviting me, Professor George. Thank you, Paul.